Welcome to Vicious Whispers with Mark Tullius, your source for horror, sci-fi, suspense, and all things violent. Thank you so much for joining me today on Vicious Whispers. At the end of the episode, I will play a short story from Twisted Reunion. That story is out there. I believe I wrote that when I was driving back and forth to Vegas all the time. Used to make that drive every weekend. It sucked. I had two jobs, but yeah, so not the best time. It also involves drugs. I am not going to say whether or not any drugs were going back and forth with me, because of course they wouldn't, because I wouldn't want to break the law. But anyhow, a story came out of that. I was also working at a prison when I wrote that, so that's probably where all the drug-related stuff came. It's not because I was transporting drugs back and forth. I would not do that. All right, hope you guys enjoy that story. So a lot of cool things happened this week. Yesterday morning, I finished Try Not to Die back at Grandma's house, or at least the Kindle Bella version, which will be released first. So I still need to finish up some of these death scenes. But the cool thing is with the Bella, I am not putting out any of those death scenes. I'm actually adding an extra choice. So instead of there usually being two to three choices at the end of a chapter, now it's three to four choices. There might be one that's only two choices. So I'm not totally sure. But... But the cool thing is on Bella, readers will be able to vote on the correct answer. They won't get to experience the fun, gruesome death. But when I release the Kindle version or the ebook version, a month or two later, it will have all the death scenes. You'll be able to read everything. The cool thing with a poll is I'll be able to see which choice sucked. And then that's the one I cut. So those three to four choices from the Kindle Bella version will be reduced to two to three. And if too many people are guessing the correct answer, then I'll have to switch it up for the real book. So I think it's going to be a really cool platform for me to test this out because right after this, I'm going to release Trench Die in the Wild West, which all we have to do is the last round of edits. It's just about done. I think I should be getting that this weekend. So that I'm going to put out in on Kindle Bella right after. So that should be awesome. We'll see how that goes. I'm not sure how many people read Bella, but it'll be a way, really cool way for me to test it out and expand my audience. Why not try it on a new platform? If all I have to do is wait an extra 30 days, if that's only negative to it, then it seems like a no-brainer. So I will try that out if it works for those two books then Transdiac Ghostland. I believe Duncan Rouse and I will put it up on there. That one is close to being done, but it's good. Duncan and I have so much going on. Besides, like, he works. I take care of the house and other stuff. We are both very busy. Just, and just the amount of writing we're trying to get done. So I'm pretty excited about that. And I have my designer working on the Kindle Bella covers now. It's a circular cover, so it's going to be a little bit different from the ebook. So I should have that in a day or two and hopefully put that up next week. So that way I am not a failure for not publishing in 2022. Yes, I feel so much better about myself now. I snuck it in or I'm about to sneak it in. It hasn't happened yet, but I am going to put trying to dive back at Graham's house on Bella very soon. Definitely before the end of the year. So hopefully you guys will want to check it out on there. What else is going on? Oh, Untold Mayhem, that is free. That book is free on Kindle for the next. Let me check my schedule. Wow, I'm all professional with the schedule and it's right here in front of my screen. What the fuck is wrong with me? All right, December 6th through the 19th, the audiobook is on sale for $2.99. But December 15th through 19th, the ebook is free. So go on Kindle. Even if And if you don't have a Kindle, you can still download it. So get the free Kindle app. You can read on any device. That is the way to do that. I was only thinking about that recently because I had a conversation with someone that was wanting to buy the German version of Twisted Reunion, Totentanz. I am advertising that on Facebook right now. I really hadn't done that, but I was like, why not give it a shot? And it looks like it's going to be really successful. So the book is doing very well. It's number one, or it's in the top three or four for horror short stories and other categories it's moving up. So I think with that, run that ad for a couple of weeks and I should, we'll see what happens, but I think it should be pretty good. Also running an ad right now for EI book. That one is not doing well yet. I have to figure out the advertising on that, what kind of readers I'm going to hit. I'm also doing advertising right now for Unlocking the Cage. There are a couple, I don't advertise that book at all. I hardly ever talk about it. It was a really awesome experience. Every once in a while, I'll check out pictures or I'll be reminded, I'll see my friends in Unlocking the Cage. We had the rash guards 
and my kids were wearing them. My wife always wore hers, all these people around the country. So that's super awesome to see. And this image behind me, I don't know if you can see it, but that is a collection of all or lots of the gyms that I went to. I went to a hundred different gyms around the country, 23 states interviewed all together like 400 people and that was with me never having interviewed a single person before in my life when i started that project i did not have any faith in myself i was like who am i to write this book who am i to go interview people and try to work out with them and all that i was like what am i even doing but my wife pushed me to do it and she said you know give it three weeks so i made a three-week trip to the east coast i said you know if it wasn't going to pan out if it didn't seem like a good thing i was just going to give it up but it was incredible and that's only because of the connections i made during the interview process working out with the guys at the start i was such terrible shape i was you know way overweight hadn't done anything for a very long time and that probably got me a little bit closer to the guys working out with them at least them seeing me try but it was 100 percent the interviews that i did one of the big places that really made an impact on me on that first trip was triforce mma a lot of very cool people there made some great friends out of that place and uh, highly recommend it i am advertising that as well that one's a little more expensive 5.99 but if you like MMA, you should pick it up. Or if you want to know why the hell I would ever risk fighting when I wasn't very good at it and I'm such a nice guy with no anger issues and no self-esteem issues and all that kind of stuff. But so not only do you get to find out why other people fight, but you find out why I tried to do it when it definitely was not a good idea. All right, I think that covers the writing side of things. Now I get to talk about the very cool event that happened yesterday. I was invited to be a guest speaker for the Lucerna High School Horror Club. I found out about the club because I saw a post from Jose Mangan, the DJ from Sirius XM, Liquid Metal, and Octane. Listen to him all the time. I think he's awesome. I'm putting him in the Death Fest book. He gets to, he's going to announce some bands. He might get killed. He may kill someone. I'm not exactly sure. I do know my buddy McCor, who's friends with him, is going to kill someone in one of the death scenes. So I let him kill one of my characters. And, but the really cool thing is I saw that Jose had been a speaker at this event. And then I realized it was like, oh, that's McCor's son who I don't know. I'm not sure if he was the president or one of the presidents of the club, but that was really awesome. I told him how cool that was that they had a horror club and then they invited me to come speak. One of the reasons I was excited about it is because when I was in high school, I felt like a weirdo for being attracted to horror, for seeking it out, wanting to see gruesome, disgusting, whatever. I wanted, I needed that kind of entertainment. That's what I really liked as a kid, whether it was, you know, starting out with Twilight Zone and just going darker and darker, sneaking movies, you know, whether it's Jason or Freddy or whatever you could get and then Faces of Death and just anything violent. I wanted to see it, whatever videos we could find. Horror is not a lesser genre. I know a lot of people view it that way. I think I used, I definitely used to view it that way. And I didn't want to be seen as a horror writer. I'd much rather have been seen as a more legitimate, you know, literary author or something like that. But that was before I came to accept and understand. It's like, no, I was like, I love writing really dark and disturbing stuff. That's what I think about all day long. Okay, how could you die here or here and Lots of that's for the try not to die. If it wasn't that, I'd be imagining a horror novel or, or some kind of suspense novel that's filled with a lot of violent stuff. I can't imagine ever writing a book where nothing bad happens. It's like, what is the point in that? Like, who would want to read that? Besides my mom. My mom would probably like to read that. She does not read my writing. Which brings me to the question that the Horror Club asked. Oh, and before I forget, thank you to both Luke and Holly Vance, the moderator, for setting that up and inviting me, getting me cleared. I was a little bit worried about that, but it all worked out. So one of the questions she asked, though, was, when did know what I thought was quality horror? What kind of books did I consider quality horror? That's a super tough question because, you know, quality is so subjective. You know, seeing readers respond to my books and all my friends' books, other authors' books, with five stars to one star. Like, someone thinks this book is complete dog shit. Another person thinks it's awesome. You know, so 
who which which of those people is right and maybe you know once there's enough reviews you can see the consensus like okay this is about a four book that's a pretty good book you know this one's a three and a half it's like oh that's a one star book that thing's garbage okay 100 people said it was garbage i'm gonna ask the dark and disturbing fear filled fiction group on facebook god damn that's a lot of f's uh, I asked them what they thought, not specific books, but like were there certain elements that they liked in horror that they thought made a book, you know, more quality. One of the themes was, you know, the buildup of suspense, not just throwing stuff out there, you know, getting right into the horror right away, build it up. For me, that's definitely true, but I've, it goes with all writings. Like I need to care about the character. If I don't care about the character, I don't care about the story. So that is one of my big things that I'm looking for. So if I'm going to say a book is high quality, that's probably, it probably has some very, very good characters. Some of the books I picked out, Needful Things by Stephen King. I thought that was an incredible book. It's been a very long time since I read it, but that idea stuck with me for an incredibly long time. Also Carrie, which I read last year with my daughter. Another book I brought out was... Haunted. I believe I like the entire book. I'm a huge fan of Chuck's writing, but the only story I really remember is Guts, the first one in here. But that alone was enough to recommend it because it's like, that's incredible. That was 15 years ago I read it, 16, 17 years ago. For that image, that story to completely stick with me, especially after all the hits to the head. So for me to remember any of those books should be pretty impressive. But I also brought some other books because so I wanted to show just how, you know, subjective quality can be. And I brought Duncan Ralston's books. So I brought The Midwives. I believe this was the first thing I read from Duncan. I thought it was awesome. Incredible book. Killer on the Loose, A Rider on the Run, A Town Plagued by Ancient Evil. Definitely reminded me of a Stephen King novel. Probably better. Well, it definitely better than... Lots of stuff I've read recently. But again, I'm a huge Stephen King fan. I owe him a ton. That was definitely one of the biggest influences. But Midwives, I said, definitely a five-star book. And then read Ghostland. You guys know why I'm bringing this one, right? Got to promote trend Diet Ghostland. And it's an excellent book. So double bonus. Anyhow, I was telling them about the Ghostland, just the overall theme, the trilogy. They all thought it was a super cool idea. They were excited about it. Then I told them about the Trinus Diet Ghostland and how much cooler it is. Not that Trinus Diet Ghostland is cooler than the original, but it's also maybe not even equally cool, but still cool. Anyhow, you guys get the idea. After that, I showed them this. Boom. And I pointed out that it's extreme horror. I didn't think I would like it. I really, you know, prior to reading it, I would not say extreme horror could be quality horror. But again, that's just me having a fucking opinion and whatever. Like that's that's what I try to get across. My opinion does not is not equal truth, right? But I brought this book. I told them I'm not recommending it to them because they're underage. But it's very extreme. It's I didn't think I was going to like it at all. I, I really didn't. I, I was surprised. And it was hard to read, but it was also incredibly well written and awesome. Like I said about the characters, I cared about these characters. I wanted to know what was going to happen. Also didn't want to know, but I pointed out how many, you know, that I gave it a five-star review. So many other people loved that book. But then there are a ton of people on the other side saying that it's garbage and giving it one star reviews. So is it quality? Is it not quality? You know, you got to you got to figure out what you like and what you don't like. And I'm definitely not the person to say, you know, what's quality or not. The group was awesome. I was worried because high school kids in my mind, like, oh, these kids aren't going to fucking want to listen to me. Who cares about me, you know, and writing and everything else. But they were all super awesome. They had great questions. They were a lot of fun. The second half of the presentation, we had a good time doing the try not to die. I ran them through the decision making scene of several books in the Try Not to Die series. So we did uh, At Grandma's House and the Pandemic, Bright Side, Wizard's Tower, but then I also did one from the Wild West and another from Death Fest. So I would give them the choices, they would answer. I was gonna have it to where the people with the top scores got a copy of the Try Not to Die book, but 
I didn't keep track. And I wasn't sure who had the most correct answers. So that part was hard. It was hard giving away the books at the end because there were a lot of people that wanted the books. I ended up giving away those four books. Plus I had a copy of 25 Perfect Days, Twist Reunion, and Untold Mayhem. So I was able to give away seven books. Hopefully I converted a couple of those people and they will want to read more and tell their friends about what an awesome, awesome author I am. I don't know. Or just cool dude. That's just support me. So do that. Yeah. I'm going to feed my kids. God damn it. I really had a great time talking with them. I appreciate them bringing me on. There was talk that they might even start a little writers group because there were a couple of writers in there. And that's super awesome. I told them if they want to do that, if they ever need any help, just to hit me up. And I would love to share whatever knowledge I have. Not that I have a ton, but I do have a little bit. So, all right, guys. I'm going to go make dinner. I'm doing this on Thursday so I could edit it Friday morning, like five in the morning, and then write my newsletter and get that shit off to you. So a lot goes into this thing because I do it all myself, but it's all good. I'm going to go upstairs, make dinner, and help my son with his homework. So we do that at the same time. We'll all eat dinner, relax. Then who knows? Maybe play a little bit of Fortnite. Probably not. I want to get to work. I, want, I got a lot of stuff to do. I want to be a huge success. And you can help me get there by liking, sharing, subscribing, all that wonderful stuff. But more than anything, thank you guys for listening. Sincerely, it definitely means a lot to me. Just like having those kids listen to me meant a lot to me. Anytime anyone wants to listen to me, because there aren't that many people I want to listen to. So if someone wants to listen to me, that's super awesome. I appreciate it. Thank you guys so much. I hope you enjoy this story. This is out there. I will see you next week. Later. Out there. Daryl glanced in the rear view and cocked a thumb over his shoulder. There she goes. Check it out. Man, keep your eyes on the road, Mike said, and then turned to look out the rain-streaked back window. The small cluster of lights comprising Baker was disappearing. In another fifty yards, the lights would completely vanish, leaving them with only their headlights and the occasional burst of lightning to alleviate the darkness of the desert. They followed the curve up the steep hill, and Daryl snuck another peek in the mirror. Exactly seventy-nine miles to Vegas. Fine but watch the road and slow down. Stop tripping, man. I got it. Mike leaned over and checked the speedometer. Drop it to 60. I'm barely doing 70. I don't care what the speed limit is. I can't see a goddamn thing with all this rain. And the last thing in this world we need is an accident. Daryl eased up a little on the accelerator, but not without restating his opinion. We're never going to get there at this rate. Relax. There's no rush. Daryl and Mike had been sleeping together for almost a year. Their families knew they were gay, but Jimmy didn't, and Jimmy was all that mattered. Daryl turned up the radio. Def Leppard's Pour Some Sugar On Me blasted through the speakers. Mike pulled the phone from his pocket. One bar faded in and out. He figured they'd get better reception once they made it over the next mountain. Mike put the phone away and leaned in the back seat, listening to the pounding rain and Joe Elliott's voice crackling in and out. Daryl slammed the radio's power button with his palm. The hell, you trying to break it? Mike asked. Might as well with all the static. Look at this car. Doesn't even have a CD player. You can deal with it for 79 miles. Well, it handles like crap, and it looks like it belongs to my mom. Exactly. What do you want, a bright red convertible? Anything would be better than this thing. And think about all the gas we're using. This thing probably gets 15 per gallon. Oh, now you're an environmentalist? Daryl gripped the minivan steering wheel with both hands, stared straight ahead, and pressed down on the accelerator. Slow it down, Mike ordered. Daryl kept his foot on the gas. Mike punched him in the neck. With a huff, Daryl brought it down to sixty. A moment later, they reached the top of the mountain and began their descent. Daryl couldn't let it go. 
We're not going to get there till sunrise and we're going to be easier to spot. Mike struggled to remain calm. He couldn't risk drawing Daryl into a shouting match when the hothead was driving. He carefully controlled his voice and said, Maybe you just don't understand certain things. We're going to be really easy to spot if we get pulled over. And if I'm found in Cali, I'm screwed, which means you're screwed. But you got that ID. I don't know if it'll fly, and I'm not risking ten years to find out. We're not getting pulled over, and if we do, I'll flash my badge. Mike tried not to laugh. You have a badge? Yeah, I'm an officer. You're a security guard. I'm a security officer. I can arrest people just like cops do. Mike shook his head. Your badge won't get us out of a ticket, and I don't want anyone searching the car. As far as gas mileage goes, you're worried about spending an extra 20 bucks. Probably more like 40, and we're down to half a tank. You're making 1500 for an eight-hour trip. Mike turned to the window. You need to let it go. The thunderstorm was getting worse. Rain pelted the van with a fury and cloaked the desert. Being stuck in the van with Daryl when he was in one of his foul moods sucked, but at least they were warm and dry. When do you think I can go by myself and start making some real money? Daryl asked. Real money? Mike laughed. It takes you three weeks of playing rent-a-cop to make fifteen hundred. You know what I mean. Trust me, I want you to start making the trip alone as soon as possible. I really don't want to get popped for violating. But first, a couple of things need to happen. Figure on coming out with me at least three more times before Jimmy trusts you. So maybe next month. February at the latest. What else? Prove to me that you can chill on these trips. I'm putting my ass on the line, letting you make the run yourself. We're talking major money here. I can chill. I'm chilling. I like it when you put your ass on the line. Mike ignored the remark. No speeding, no reckless driving, no stopping anywhere but for gas, no unnecessary calls. Yeah, that's... Daryl cut himself off and looked out Matt's window. Craning his neck, his eyes followed something as they passed on the side of the road. What are you looking at? There was a car back there. Daryl checked the rearview mirror. They're so screwed. Mike looked out the back, unable to see through the rain. There's nothing out there. It was a car. Mike sat back in his chair. Even if it was, it's not our concern. You don't have to be a dick. If they don't have a cell, I'm sure the cops will be by and call a tow truck for them. They better hurry. That's not a place to break down, Daryl said. They're less than ten miles from Baker. Daryl shook his head. No, man. You never heard about this area? What are you talking about? You wouldn't believe the number of people that get killed out here. Outside of Baker? Yeah. At least fifty deaths in the last year. You have no idea. You're from Vegas. You guys don't care about the crazy stuff that happens out here. I'm sure I would have heard about it if fifty people got killed. Hell, I'd say at least fifty. And I stopped looking it up. You want me to believe that fifty people died out here? Mike asked. They found some bones, and the rest just vanished. Some bones? Vanished? I thought you said fifty died. It sounds more like missing. They listed them all as missing, but they're dead. No bullshit. Daryl peered out of Matt's window, as if he could see something out there. Mike caught himself looking, too, but the impenetrable darkness blocked everything except the two feet of highway to his right. Mike said, I bet it was just people leaving and never coming back. If I grew up in Baker, I'd vanish the second I was old enough to drive. Yeah, but would you leave your car on the side of the road in the middle of nowhere? Would your bones be found weeks later, picked clean, not a scrap of meat on them? You're an idiot. Daryl shook his head. 
I'm telling you the truth. There's something out there. Matt's cell phone vibrated. He told Daryl to shut up before he answered it. Where the hell are you? The gruff voice said. What's up, Jimmy? We're... I've been trying to get hold of you for the last 20 minutes. We passed Baker about 15, 20 minutes ago. We should... Uh... Hey, Jimmy? Jimmy, y are you there? Mike looked down at the cell's screen and shook his head. Frickin' T-Mobile. What'd he say? I don't know. Nothing. It's fine. Mike didn't want to think about Jimmy. He asked, So what were you saying about all the disappearances? You think it's aliens? Chupacabra? It's not funny, man. People die out here. I'm sure they do. Another vibration. Hold on, it's Jimmy again. He answered the call. What's up, Jimmy? Did you hit the state line yet? No, we're about 60 miles from Vegas, maybe 30 to the border. What are you driving? I don't know. It looks like a Dodge. Yeah, yeah, it's a Dodge. A Dodge what? Hey, Daryl, what is this thing? Mike asked. Well, what model? Caravan. Just loud enough for Mike to hear, Daryl said. We could have had a Cadillac. Hear that? A, a caravan. What's the license plate number? Mike opened up the glove box, pulled out the registration, and read off the number. Jimmy yelled, You dumb shits! Pull it over! What are you talking about? We're in the middle of nowhere and it's pouring! Pull it over! Jimmy barked. Uh, you're breaking up. I'll... I'll, I'll... I'll pull over at the rest stop. Uh, there, there's one up ahead a few miles. I saw a sign. No, you ass clown. You've been made. The signal faded, leaving Mike with a dead line. What was that all about? Daryl asked. Jimmy wants us to pull over. I think he said we're made. Are you kidding? We can't pull over. He said... You said he thought he said we were made. Maybe he was saying something else. Like what? He wanted us to pull over. Call him back. Another vibration. This is him right now. Pull over while I have reception. Are you serious? Just pull over. I don't want to lose him, Mike said. What's up, Jimmy? You hear me? Pull over, Matt. You've been made. You sure? How do you know? Paul got popped about an hour after you left. Vice swarmed the house and they knew what they were looking for. The only thing they found was the money, but Paul must have sold you out. Paul's girl told me about the bust, so I started monitoring police radio. They've got an APB out on the van. Ditch the cargo. Tell me you're joking. Mike glanced over his shoulder, ready to see flashing lights coming up from behind them. You ditch that stuff. Find some place safe. Go to Vegas. Get another set of wheels and pick it up tomorrow night. Where? Where am I going to stash it? I'm in the middle of the goddamn desert. Somewhere someone else ain't going to stumble onto it. And don't leave the van anywhere near it. I know. Mike checked the side window, wished he could see more than a few feet through the sea of darkness. But how are we supposed to get to Vegas? at my pad. Whatever you say, Jimmy, and, and thanks for the heads up. I'll, I'll, I'll find the place for this stuff, and I'll get back to you. As Mike hung up, Daryl asked, So, what's happening? Mike stuffed the cell into his pocket. We need to dump the cargo. Cops are looking for the van. Dump it? We don't have a choice. Well, they won't catch us. And if they did, it's my first offense. They'll let me go. We have 200 pounds. That's trafficking. If we get stopped, we're both screwed. Daryl shifted into park and took his foot off the brake. So what do we do? Where do we stash it? Mike thumbed toward the window. Somewhere out there. No way, man. That ain't happening. Uh, how about the rest stop? Too many people, and they've got cameras. Mike peered through the windshield. He spotted a line of cars a mile down the hill. 
brake lights. They've already blocked off the road. You don't know that. There could be an accident. Daryl clearly didn't believe that, though, because he asked, You really think they're looking for us? It sure as hell isn't a coincidence. Let's get this stuff out of here before someone rolls by and spots us. I can't go out there. Mike shook his head in disgust. I'm not kidding. There's bad things out there. Bullshit. Even if there were, I guarantee there are worse things in prison. Daryl closed his eyes, took a deep breath, and let it out. When he opened his eyes, he pulled his Ruger SR-40 from his waistband, where he kept it concealed under his bulging belly. Mike reached over, pulled the keys out of the ignition. Put on your hood. Daryl leaped from the van without a word. Mike met him underneath the canopy of the open rear hatch. Are we going to bury it? Daryl asked. With what? I didn't pack a shovel. So where do we put these? Daryl asked, looking at the two huge suitcases. At least they were hard shell and not canvas. Those hills. Mike pointed toward a shadowy range running parallel with the road. But there's got to be some rocks where we can hide them. Daryl stared through the rain. You have any idea how far that is? No way. A hundred yards or so. We'll be there in a minute. Come on. No way. That's at least three hundred. We'll be soaked. We're going to have worse problems than that. Mike dragged the first suitcase out of the car, surprised by how heavy it was, and then raised the wheel well cover. Before Daryl noticed, he grabbed the thirty-eight special he had hidden there and stuffed it into his coat pocket. Come on, it's letting up. It wasn't, but Mike was already crossing the muddy stretch of road that bordered the highway. Mike heard the second suitcase hit the pavement, and the rear door slam shut. Reluctantly, Daryl followed, but not without finding a new combination of curse words. The complaining didn't last long. Dragging one hundred pounds through the treacherous terrain and torrential downpour wore them out. Halfway to the hills, Mike set his suitcase down in a clearing. He acted like it was so he could check on his partner, and not because of the burning sensation in his arms and lungs. He heard Daryl's grunts over the rain slapping the hard desert floor, but he couldn't see him. A loud hiss sliced through the air. Mike whirled around and backed up, looking for the serpent, his hand on the thirty-eight's grip, but he couldn't see a thing in the darkness. Still, the hiss sliced through the deluge. When Daryl entered the clearing a few seconds later, the hissing stopped. Daryl dropped his suitcase onto its side. He was breathing so hard Mike feared his overweight boyfriend would have a heart attack. God damn, this is heavy. How much farther? He asked, between gasps, looking past Mike toward the hills. We got a way to go. I'm tired too, but we need to keep moving. This is still too close. We aren't going to make it. What? Mike stepped onto a rock, but couldn't see over the small hill that blocked their view of the highway. Last I looked, they were all over the van. Three cars. Mike scrambled up the rocky hill, the sight of flashing lights making him nauseous. Daryl asked, Now what? They're going to be all over this area. What if we can make it to the rest stop and jack a car? That's the only thing I can think of. They're going to be crawling all over it. They know we're close. The hills are our only shot. So what then? What the hell do we do even if we make it? First off, we hide the suitcases. We can't get caught with this. They'll still bust me for violating, but that's better than the alternative. Mike tried to control his shivering. Let's move before they get a helicopter out here. They'll know we're on this side of the highway. Maybe they'll think someone picked us up. No way. And watch where you're stepping. Mike grabbed the suitcase and dragged it up over a large rock. Snakes are out. Nah, they're not out now. The burning sensation returned to his shoulders. I know what I heard. Well, you didn't hear a snake. They hibernate in winter. Must have been something else. In no mood to argue, Mike pushed forward, leaving Daryl behind. Soaked and exhausted, Mike stopped after a few hundred yards. The rain was letting up, but that wasn't a good thing. 
Mike could see the cops still by the van, which means they could probably see him. The mountains, which he thought were hills, were still half a mile away. Mike crouched down, holding his head in both hands. He'd rest while Daryl caught up, and then they'd make one last run for the mountains. They could make it, he told himself. A hiss rustled in the bushes. He looked around. It wasn't rain. There wasn't a drop falling. The hiss grew louder. It sounded as if it were coming from two different directions. Mike stood and pulled out his piece. He wasn't scared of snakes, and he refused to get bitten and die lying on top of a suitcase of ecstasy. The clouds slid over and let the moon shine through. Even with its light, Mike couldn't see much. Sand, brush, rocks, cacti, and more sand. No snakes. He did see Daryl huffing his way up the slight incline, his face drenched, only this time from sweat, not rain. Once again, the hissing stopped. The chopper's out, Daryl said in between gulping breaths. He dropped the suitcase onto the damp sand and bent over, hands resting on his knees. We're screwed. That hill won't hide us much longer. We need to keep moving, Mike said. Daryl raised his arms over his head, something he must have seen an athlete do on TV. Only Mike doubted the athlete's belly hadn't poured over his belt. Come on, Daryl, that's enough. We have to hit the mountains. Mike left out that they'd already have been there if Daryl had taken care of himself. I'm too tired. I'll leave you. Go ahead. Daryl sat on a rock. I can't move. I'll leave you in the dark with the cops and the snakes and whatever little boogie monster you think is out here. There ain't no snakes, I told you. Well, there's something out here hissing, and I'm leaving you with it. Are you coming? Hold on, goddammit. I never should have come. I didn't hear you bitching when I asked you before. You weren't complaining about making some cash. Mike picked up the suitcase, hoping it would be easier to carry than it was to drag. We get through this, and Jimmy will put you on any score you want. That finally got Daryl on his feet. In the ten minutes it took to make it to the base of the mountain, the helicopter hadn't advanced much. It was too early for Mike to get his hopes up, but it looked as if he might make it out of this thing a free man. Daryl might not, but that was his own fault. If the fat bastard had taken care of himself, he wouldn't be on the verge of passing out as he tried to keep up. Now what? Daryl said. We hide the suitcases. Mike pointed to the small cave twenty yards uphill. In there. Without a word, Daryl began the ascent. Mike nearly ran into him when Daryl came to an abrupt stop right outside the opening. What the hell's the matter? Get in there, Mike ordered. Daryl whispered. It's dark. Mike shouldered past him. You give Gaze a bad name. I think I heard something. What? What could be out here? Mountain lion? Get your gun and watch your step. It sounded like some kind of hissing. Mike took a few steps past the entrance and turned around. I thought you said they were hibernating. They should be, Daryl stammered. Mike heard the low hiss but pretended he hadn't. He turned back to Daryl. You want to make money, you want more responsibility, and you want to do the runs yourself? Why would Jimmy let you? You're afraid of the dark, afraid of snakes. What else are you afraid of, Daryl? Screw you. No, thank you. I don't do vaginas. Daryl finally grabbed his suitcase. Mike told him to take his too and put them as far back in the cave as he could. If you want your cut. Why don't we each take one? Because one of us should stay out here and keep an eye on that helicopter. Well, it looks pretty dark in there. If we both go in, we could get lost. At least you can follow my voice. I'll be right here. Come on, we don't have all night. Daryl groaned, but did as Mike ordered, and picked up his suitcase. I can't carry both of them, he said. Make two trips. 
Daryl disappeared in the cave's darkness. Mike sat on his suitcase and watched as the police helicopter circled the desert a few hundred yards away. After several minutes passed, he began to wonder if Daryl had decided to take a break. Mike took one step into the cave. Daryl, hurry up! The helicopter's getting closer! There was no response, so he cupped his hands around his mouth and shouted, Daryl, can you hear me? Again, no answer. Mike picked up his suitcase and headed down the dark tunnel, using his free hand to feel the wall alongside him. After a few seconds, he sensed the tunnel widening into a cavern. He called Daryl's name once more. A prolonged hiss echoed through the cave. Slowly, Mike set the suitcase down and pulled the gun out of his coat. When he turned in a circle to pinpoint the noise, he looked out the tunnel and noticed the helicopter's searchlight was closer. No longer caring where Daryl was, Mike picked up his suitcase and headed for the closest wall. He tripped over something solid and slammed face first into the cave's hard floor. The hissing grew louder and seemed to be coming from multiple directions. Ignoring his bleeding chin and scraped hand, Mike leaped off the floor before the snakes could strike. He reached for his pistol, but it wasn't there. He got to his knees and felt the floor. When his hand struck plastic, he realized he'd tripped over Daryl's suitcase. What the hell's wrong with you? I could have knocked myself out. Daryl didn't answer. But even if he had, Mike wasn't sure if he could have heard him over the now deafening hisses. He prayed it was the cave's echoes, but it sounded as if he were surrounded. Mike reached for Daryl's suitcase and felt Daryl's arm draped over it. He squeezed Daryl's hand. Get up, man! He shook the arm harder and almost retched when it pulled away from the suitcase and fell onto his lap. The arm had been severed at the elbow. Mike reached out and couldn't feel Daryl's body anywhere. Mike threw the arm into the darkness and heard a grunt when it bounced off something. He scrambled on all fours toward the entrance. The searchlight illuminated the cave's mouth. A sinewy hand wrapped around his neck, cutting off his scream. Mike clawed at the scaly fingers, deafened by the hissing, unable to move. He stared straight ahead. The entrance was gone. He couldn't see outside, but he knew that the cops were out there. Getting caught meant ten years locked in a nine-by-nine nine cell. But that decade was gone. <laughs>